We all misbehave sometimes Wanna change the world Indulge in some bad Welcome to Bad Behaviour, the podcast where we talk about feminism, activism and our journey to being the best, baddest bitches we can possibly be. My name is Nicola. I'm Rosalind and welcome to a new episode. We are in preparation for a sad event. Nicola is leaving me. She is abandoning me to be left here alone, sad. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm super psyched about it, but... If you want to go down that She's route. She's going on vacation. <laughs> She's going to Europe with her American friends. And then will I ever see her again? Or will she become a social media influencer and never come <laughs> oh back? Oh my God. <laughs> that is for sure not going to happen. It could happen. And I'm not bitter about it at all. I'm ready for you to go. And it's fine. I'll just be here working and studying and you'll be on vacation. And that's okay with me. I mean, it sounds like you're not bitter at all, and, and that's really <laughs> heartwarming to hear. That's super heartwarming. Yeah. But um, listeners, we have some really great plans in the works for while Claire is away, so don't worry. It's going to be it's gonna be a great ride, and I am excited for you, Nicola. It will be fine. I will you be fine. You just keep telling yourself that, and one day <laughs> you'll finally believe it and convince me of that. Do you want to tell me how you've been bad this week, Roz? Okay, so this week... I came to a realization about subtlety. I love your realizations. They benefit everyone. <laughs> they really do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm not joking. When you haven't, you know, gone out and said fuck you to the patriarchy, all you have is self epiphany. Okay? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> anyway, I am not subtle about so I am subtle in some ways. So subtle that I find it hard to flirt. But definitely when people are like, hey, oh my gosh, Rosalind, there's a really hot chick over in the corner. And I'm like, where? <laughs> and I turn around. I'm staring at everyone in the room. And they're like, dude, we wanted to have a little sneaky chat about the really cool, good looking person. And we were going to have fun and have a giggle. And you've given the game away. And now yeah, we have- I mean, I've been there for those moments. You know, you just st- make eye contact <laughs> with the person. Look, I'm a people person. I like to connect with people. I mean, I'm down for that. But there's also a difference between like whispering about someone and then looking them straight in the eye and well I'm glad you've uh, had an epiphany of that sort because it will save us a lot of awkward social interactions let me tell you I think that we all need to be aware that we all have talents in a conversation you know and you all have things that you need to work on and this is one of mine anyway Nicola how have you been bad this week okay so my being bad is actually a story from one of our listeners side note it's my sister (laughs) oh she's like contractually obliged to listen to this podcast yeah so anyway she told me this story and I was like oh my goodness can I tell this on bad behavior because it's pretty kick-ass and it's just like a classic calling out people's bullshit so she was at a party she was in a group male dominated so there were like three guys and there were two girls and they were talking about comedians and this comedy special on Netflix that was you know over 18 and part of the comedy special was jokes about rape these boys were basically saying how funny it was and how you know it was so like it was such a good time to watch this special and they loved it and my sister basically was like no that's not okay everything can contributes to the rape culture so she basically called them out on this and was like I don't think you can joke about this kind of stuff ever it's just not appropriate they were not keen about that idea you know went down the hole it's just a joke like take it as a joke that she stuck to her guns saying that it wasn't okay it's not okay to contribute to this really damaging culture the next morning one of the guys who she'd had this conversation with actually added her on Facebook and he sent her a message being like you know I'm sorry I made you feel uncomfortable with that conversation last night you know now that you've told me I'll try and like in the future 
make an effort to not uh, have those yes. conversations like that anymore. So it was really cool. When she was telling me this, I was like, yes, you know, it's hard to call people out when it's a party setting, you know, like you don't want to be the buzz kill or anything like that. But she did it and she was like, yeah, you know, I had to. Well done her. But also shout out to the allies. Male allies are so important and many of them start that way. It starts with someone calling something out and saying, actually, I want you to think about this and them taking it to heart and actually thinking about it and opening their mind to that differing experience from their worldview and letting it change them in some way. And I am proud of that man for adding her on Facebook and saying that to her because, you know, when you are told that you're in the wrong, you can get in a defensive state and not be ready to listen and not be ready to, you know, change your perspective. It's difficult and it's confronting. And that's really awesome that she was able to stick to her guns and get to a point where she had actually got through to them. That's amazing. Shout out to our listener. Nicola's sister. (laughs) So I am so excited for our topic this week. So excited because it was brought about because we previously spoke about architecture and we talked about two very incredible women, Dr. Julia King and Laurie Brown. And Julia King actually tweeted us saying, you know, thank you for chatting about me, something like that. And she gave us this amazing engineer and Nicola, I want to hear about her. Okay, so I'm really excited to talk about this woman, but first of all, this is definitely a topic that hits close to home for me because my dad is actually an engineer and so in prep for this episode I gave him a call and I asked him because he's worked in the engineering industry for 30 years 30 plus years and so I wanted to get his perspective on the gender imbalance and if he saw how it was changing and he said that recently he's really seen a huge significant shift like things are changing and then I asked him in his current workplace if there were many women and he said in the whole workplace there's probably less than five women but he was saying that it definitely has been shifting as of late and he's seen a lot more women come into leadership roles and he's been given the opportunity to to hire women which is really cool and you know he wouldn't have been able to do that earlier in his career. So I thought that was a cute little side note to actually talk to my dad about it because he's, you know, achieved amazing things in his career and he's super dedicated and to actually hear him say that, you know, he's seen a shift, that's really, really cool. That aside, okay, so the incredible woman that I am doing today is Ailey McAdam. So she is a British chemical engineer. Her father was a mechanical engineer. Godfather was a chemical engineer. So she was born into a family of engineers and she has built an incredible career and been such a pioneer in terms of the projects that she's managed and directed. I was so excited to get to research her. So she has a Bachelor of Chemical Engineering and she started off her career in oil and gas and then made the transition mid-career to rail and transportation. And that's where a lot of her massive projects are and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So throughout all these huge projects that she's been involved in one of the big things that she always comes back to is better representation of women in the engineering industry so that's a huge passion point for her and she always pioneers it in any project that she's doing and she's very open and honest about it so she works for Bechtel which is a leading construction engineering and project management company she's worked for them for 30 years and she's led major major UK and US infrastructure projects and then oil gas and chemical projects in Europe and Africa she was the delivery director for the central section of Crossrail and Crossrail is the one of Europe's largest engineering projects that's ever been undertaken and she was responsible for building 42 kilometers of new train tunnels and seven new stations and over 7.5 billion pounds of new Crossrail infrastructure. So she headed up this project and there is an above average percentage of 
female engineers that worked on this project. So 30% of the engineers on this really massive engineering project were women. And she says, visible role models are important and you have to engage and challenge an organization. We need to recognize everyone has an inherent bias. Even I had a watershed moment when I was looking to recruit. I realized I was imagining a a white middle-aged man in the post. I was shocked. We've tried to identify any bias in our graduate recruitment, for instance, and we measure it. 10 years, we've had a global women's group at Bechtel, and that's very strong. That's one of her main priorities with every project, and she's really, really passionate about it. She was a project manager responsible for delivering London's £600 million St. Pancreas station renovation, and she delivered that on time and on budget, which doesn't seem to happen a lot of the times with these huge renovations of transportation system. The list goes on and on and on. So she's currently Senior Vice President of Bechtel and she's based in Sydney actually. So she's currently working on the Sydney Metro City and Southwest project over there and she's basically in charge of all aspects of the Australian branch, business development and the project delivery there. So she's just conquering the world, you know, one transportation system at a time. And she is a fellow of the Institute of Civil Engineers. She's a STEM ambassador. She was in 2016, she was listed as one of the UK's top 50 women in engineering, honoured as an inspirational leader at the UK Construction Industries Inspire Award, just has achieved immensely amazing things and she says we have a responsibility to do more to address the issues find out why women don't pursue this line of work and provide opportunities for them to be successful it is also vitally important that we reach out to young girls before they choose their path through education to dispel myth show girls that engineering is a viable option and how rewarding it can be she's just so exciting to me like it's so cool to see every project she does you know, the next one is more complex and more difficult. Like she never stops learning. She never stops challenging the type of things that she says yes to and then achieves. She will just continue to kick our ass. I can almost guarantee it. So yeah, (laughs) that's my story. Can I hear yours? Absolutely. So I am going to be talking about Yasmin abdel Magid, and she's pretty well known and she has been kind of a controversial figure in Australia for a variety of reasons, most of which were completely crazy. Okay, I'll get into it in a sec. So Yasmin is a mechanical engineer. She's a writer and she's an activist and she started young. And she first founded an organization at 16 called Youth Without Borders. And so she was getting going, ready to knock down those doors pretty young. She's also founded Mumtaza, which aims to empower women of color, and Kuwa, which tackles sexual harassment in the workplace. She has admitted that she is a petrol head. So after high school, she went on to study mechanical engineering in Queensland and she helped run the university's race team and got enrolled with race car design. And she loves Formula One, which I know nothing about, but she adores. And she wanted to continue on with motorsports and she was actually offered a place to study um, a master's degree in the UK. But she decided that she's quite conservative Sudanese parents and she wanted to be useful to society and so she decided to go another way and she actually worked on some really remote Australian oil and gas rigs she was the only woman on those rigs and she was certainly the only Muslim woman there and they called her hijab a tea cozy oh my god which is just (laughs) pretty full on but she speaks about it in a really warm way so it's really lovely she has a lot of different awards so many that i chose two <laughs> out of a lot in 2018 she won the young voltaire award for free speech and in 2015 she was queensland young australian of the year so i as always i chose someone with a ted talk and that seems very common for me now yeah her ted talk is incredible it's so good it's called what does my headscarf mean to you and it's been viewed almost two million times in fact i think it's over two million times now and if you haven't seen it definitely check it out unless you're one of the two million people who have very likely (laughs) it actually brings up a lot of what you were talking about nicola because she discusses how 
people view Muslim women and the unconscious bias and prejudice that many people have. And so she comes out in one outfit and then she says, would you expect me to work on an oil rig? Or would you be looking at me and thinking, oh, you know, she's conservative, you know, she's probably married and all of these other ideas that kind of come to you because of her clothing. And she talks about how how important mentorship is for people who don't have these same opportunities as minorities or people who had a disadvantaged upbringing, you know, might not have had the access to education and opportunities that other people do. So we should be helping them up and using mentoring because that is something that doesn't need institutionalized change. Everybody can go out and actually do that. So she's got some really cool points in it. So definitely check it out. So she's an advocate for diversity in politics and in media. And she talks really candidly about how Muslims are represented presented post 9-11 and one of her controversies here in Australia was that she went on Q&A which is a political question and answer (laughs) uh, show and she said that she believed that Islam was the most feminist religion and that Sharia law has been sort of over politicized and it just means that you follow the law of the land that you're on it doesn't necessarily mean what everybody jumps to when they start saying Muslims are terrible and so people really blew up about that and it became hugely controversial in Australia which just shows how the climate was against Muslims at the time and probably still is yeah have a long way to go Yeah, definitely. So she talks about the idea of fundamental Islam. She's had questions asked about her being a a moderate Muslim. And she says, when I grew up, the idea of fundamentalism was adhered to the fundamentals of the faith. That's like praying and being kind and those sorts of things. The question is, who gets to define these terms about Muslims? Muslims do not define these terms by themselves. You've just had years and years of particularly framing Muslim people. So it was that idea of we say fundamentalists and it means extreme, but she's saying you know fundamental for her was just fundamentally looking at the faith and treating it in a traditional conservative kind of way and then bringing that tradition into her life and so it's it's really interesting especially for me I was raised Catholic but I was also raised sort of Buddhist Wiccan whole conglomeration of things and I am an atheist now but I think it's it's really interesting to hear people's idea of faith and again the the biases that people have about faith so she has a memoir called Yasmin's Story. It was published in 2016. She's done a lot of writing. She's written for publications like Teen Vogue, The New York Times, The Guardian. She's been to a heap of literary festivals. Sorry, side note. She's actually coming to the Melbourne Writers Festival. I have bought tickets for one of her events that she's doing here and I'm so excited. Wait, you bought (laughs) tickets without me? I was so excited. There's so many good... (laughs) events that are going on i bought like a package deal anyways that was a side note this is a really controversial side note and we will be having words. okay fine back to yasmin <laughs> <laughs> she um is a regular on the guilty feminist podcast which i love um and she's had a documentary called the truth about racism she created hijab Bistas for the abc which is a series that looks at modest fashion in australia so she's really cool she's done a lot of different things she's got her hands in many different pies and she's an engineer and she does talk about how you know people kind of forget that but she worked there for a long time so the other controversy that people do know her very well for is that in 2017 on Anzac Day which is a day that people remember all the people who died during the Gallipoli it's a war memorial day so it is for a lot of people it's a a really serious day and she posted lest we forget Manus, Nauru, Syria and Palestine and People found this really disrespectful. People found this really full on. And so she had to delete it. She apologized. But it had a huge, huge amount of hatred against her. And she had campaigns against her. There were politicians who were talking about it. It exploded. And it was actually part of her decision. She's actually moved to London and she's based in London now. And that hatred behind this anti-Yasmin campaign was It was incredible to see. I remember. It was so strong and horrible to witness. And funnily enough, it's what I knew her for. I didn't know her for all of her incredible activism. Well, I think that's when mainstream media started writing about her it was it felt quite conservative it felt quite like you know she's trying to say she was trying to make a statement about war and on a day that was a remembrance day but maybe should have been taken as you know a moment to contextualize our world and say we remember the Anzacs but we can think about current events that's how I would see it but obviously 
for people that Anzac is a huge deal for, they didn't take it that way at all. (laughs) I'm completely on the same page as you two, though. I think it's a moment to reflect and to understand how that history and the history of the people you're remembering is repeating itself because I have followed her for a long time and I remember seeing that tweet like I did not in any capacity think that it would blow up as much as it did because once she was getting all that backlash for it I remember thinking, oh, what? Like, what, what is it about specifically? Like, did she say something no. <laughs> else that was hateful? Yeah. Or it wasn't. Mm. It was that tweet that you just you just scrolled past. It was and you really were like, full oh, on. good one. And um, I guess, you know, we're not in a position where Anzac Day is particularly personal, I think. But at the same time, even if it is, it's just such a – it just felt like such an overreaction. And it was so vicious. It was vicious. Yeah. But it actually, it's interesting because she does make a lot of points that when I was looking at this controversy again, in a little bit more context as from who she was, she talks about activism today and she talks about how public advocates, um, their platform is digital and greatly magnified. An issue or debate unfolding in one place can be amplified through a video or tweet to gain international support or condemnation, sometimes both, simultaneously. So it's this idea that, you know, as an advocate and as an activist, now you are faced with this kind of controversy when you try and make these controversial statements which you know if people weren't willing to do what would happen we would just be saying okay yeah let's leave it and we need to make these statements because otherwise we can't critically analyze our world and our place in our world absolutely so it's necessary for people like her to say things like that and even if you disagree having someone say something like that and then saying okay how am I reacting is a really good thing let's start the conversation about Nauru and refugees and what that means for people who are mourning and remembering a really big moment in Australian history what does that context mean in the face of current events Let's think about it. Let's not throw hatred at one person. It's insane. She says, imagine every single piece of information about you, which you have inadvertently made available online somehow in the hands of someone who does not know you, does not like you and does not care what happens to you, either a teenage hacker or a national broadsheet and few rules or consequences if that information is used against you. It is almost enough to terrify an activist into silence. Almost. Almost. Because she has not stayed silent. But it's true. How many people don't say things because they're afraid of this insane amount of condemnation? And, you know, Yasmin talks about how much it has impacted her life negatively, completely. And it's disappointing. It's so disappointing to see that reaction. So she says that people say that you should get offline. You know, if this is the reaction, don't do it get offline but she points out that the online world and the offline world they're not mutually exclusive mutually exclusive they are the same world we live in a world that is online now it ignores how important online activism is if you say you have to get offline yeah well it's basically saying that if you're going to get a reaction why say anything at all yasmin has done such incredible things for to bring these issues to light and to call out the the hatred that really runs deep in Australia about these types of things and you know the fact that she was forced to relocate because of that this country is has now given up one of its you know pioneering activists because of hate sad people feel like they can place the hate of an entire country yeah. on your shoulders that is terrifying oh but look how she's reacted like she's continued to thrive she's still writing she's still commenting she's still using her voice and she's an incredible woman i love that she has such an interesting journey to this point she's a engineer who really saw how little people like her are represented and she went out and then she used her voice in a new way and she's talking about diversity which is so important her book is so good too. I re- would recommend it to everyone because it's um, a great, great book. And she's super stylish. She's such a fashionista. Follow her on Instagram because you will not be disappointed with her fashion posts. She is, I cannot, I wish I could pattern clash like she does. She does it and it just looks effortless. And I hardly ever even pattern at all nowadays. 
oh, be more like Yasmin then. Come on. We need to get I some know. of this. I just wear black. No. I'm so Melbourne. <laughs> I admire her fashion choices so much. I think she's an icon. <laughs> Absolutely an icon. You heard it here first. Activist, engineer, fashion icon. Definitely. Absolutely. No doubt about it. The moral of the story is that if you can mentor someone, do it. I mean, that's not the only me- the moral, but that's that's what I'm going to... Another moral is wear patterns. Yes. The other moral is that, you know, there are people in this world who can look after billion dollar projects and do them well. Can I just say? <laughs> so one day it could be me. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> When you sit on that subway, on that metro, on that, when you tap that Mikey on, think someone. When you use that. Oyster card. Oyster, that's what they use in the no, UK. What's the, one, what's the one in New York? Uh, metro card. Is it just a. Subway. Oh, that's not. That's not. What are you. Yeah, that's not an exciting name. Okay. <laughs> I thought you used to, thought I was <laughs> lying to you. I was like, no, that's what it's called. I promise you. No, I know it is. Does, does London use Oyster? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, right? We have Mikey in Melbourne, which is the silliest name ever. No, but it's like my key. My key to transport. Oh, what does Oyster whatever. mean? Oyster is a delicious snack. The world's your oyster? It's not delicious at all. I know it's gross. I don't like oysters. <laughs> You're a vegetarian. I know. I was, just, I was trying to... You know? <laughs> anyway, but- on that note, thank you so much for listening to this episode. We'll put their social media details on our website. And please come back next time for another wonderful episode of Bad Behavior Podcast.